I have uh, made a series of uh, little short, short, short stories that are uh, private thoughts, things that most people would say only to their dog. And I thought I would do a podcast that, uh, that summarize them. It's going to be about a half hour long, maybe 10 of these. Anyway, uh, the first one is called A 12-Year-Old Talks to Her Dog. Hi, my name is Lily and I'm 12. Maybe you won't be surprised that there are things I feel I can't talk about even with my best friends. So I talked to my doggie, May May. Here is what I said to her today. It's not word for word, but you'll get the idea. Who am I, really? Yeah, I'm biracial and that's cool, but what else? I'm smart, but there are smarter girls. I'm pretty, I guess. At least my parents say so. But there are prettier girls, like Jasmine. And I got my period, but am I straight? Gay? Bisexual? It's cool to be trans. Would I be that? I don't think so. But when will I develop breasts, real breasts? Will I always be chocolate chips? I guess that would be okay. I still don't like boys much. Should I worry about that? Nah. A lot of boys are immature. Some still even pull girls' hair. And my school books and TV and movies tell us that most boys and men are worse than girls and women. I mean, like what pops to my mind, the movies, Frozen, Moana, Mulan, Matilda, Princess and the Frog. The girls are always better than the boys, and especially the men. I wonder what boys seeing all that must feel like. I worry more about my privilege. School tells me I'm privileged and have to give it up. But my parents worked hard to earn what they're calling, that is, the schools are calling, privilege. But I'd be afraid to say that in class. Oh, well, I am so, so grateful to have you, May May. Want to go for a walk? Okay, so that first story is about a 12-year-old's private thoughts. This next one is called A College Student Talks to His Dog. I couldn't tell my parents. I couldn't even tell my friends. I think college has been a poor use of my time and my parents' money. But I wanted to talk it out, so I decided to talk to you, my dog, Charlie. Charlie, I don't have the guts to quit. I mean, it's hard enough to get a good job with a college degree. But God, I have a hard time even motivating myself to go to class, let alone to study hard for tests. The stuff feels unimportant, or like brainwashing. My best friends are Cliff's Notes and Spark Notes. I haven't yet descended to buying term papers on the net, in part because some professors use software to check for that. But I am increasingly tempted. The social life is fine, but $300,000 for four years of playtime feels like a very expensive four-year summer camp. I mean, if I were smart enough to be pre-med or could likely become a good lawyer or something, okay, but I'm your typical psych major, 3.0 GPA, and I haven't impressed any professor enough to expect to get more than a blog recommendation. But what would I do if I didn't finish college? Of course, first I'd have to escape from my father yelling at me, but after that, military? I'm not the type, and besides, I don't want to risk having my head blown off. An apprenticeship? Maybe, but it's four years long and not easy to get. Besides, do I really want to become an electrician or a plumber? Not really. Self-employment sounds good, but it's scary. I'm not Mr. Risk Taker. So, Charlie, what the hell should I do? Okay, okay, I know you won't answer me, but I love you anyway. Okay, here's a treat. Anyway, the next story is called A Cheese Clerk Talks to His Dog. I have a bachelor's degree, so I feel embarrassed to tell people I'm perfectly happy being a clerk at the cheese counter in a supermarket. But I like to process things, not just cheese either. So today I talked with my dog, Cheddar, about why I like it, why I'm not ambitious like everyone else. Dear Cheddar, most of my friends don't like their job. Usually they say they're putting up with crap because they feel they have to pay dues before getting a good job. But I know a lot of older people with so-called good jobs who feel they're overworked, underpaid, stressed, or feel they're not making much difference. 
My job isn't just no stress. It's not just the hours are regular. No one's going to call me at home to say they need a camembert. And I satisfy nearly every customer. We sell good cheeses at a fair price. And I get to give out free samples. Everyone loves getting a freebie, and I like giving them. The pay is not great, but with a roommate, I can make it. The only thing I gotta watch out for is eating too much cheese. A little is fine, but... So, dear Cheddar, do you think I'm fooling myself and sooner than later I'll want a real career, but I won't be hireable because who would want to hire a cheese clerk? I don't know. But in the meantime, Cheddar, how about a belly rub? The next one is called an Israeli veteran talks to her dog. Hello, my name is Dahlia. I just finished my required service in the Israeli army. Part of me is honored to defend our tiny state of Israel, but yes, I have some mixed feelings now. Even though our country is much more open to debate than is Gaza or any of the large Muslim countries that surround us, I'm shy by nature, so I feel most comfortable talking about it to my sweet dog, Luna. Today I decided to talk to her, not in sentences, but just to free associate whatever word or phrase came to mind. Here's what I recall. Palestinian kids. Horrible. Overreaction? World will hate us more than ever. Forever? Anti-Semitism. The Israeli people. The Jewish people. Scientists. Filmmakers. Women's rights. Minority rights. Arabs serve in the Knesset, our government. Arabs are 20% in Israel. Jews in Muslim countries? Zero. Will Israel be destroyed? Hamas. Hamas schools. Train kids to kill Jews. From the river to the sea? Jihad. Rockets. My sister. Fuck the terrorists. Music festival. Kibbutz. Cafes. Buses. Bar mitzvahs. Bat mitzvahs. Tunnels. Tunnels, tunnels. We gave Hamas Gaza 20 years ago. We're not occupiers. Hezbollah, Islamic Jihad, Al-Aqsa Martyr Brigade, PLO, Iran, regional war, nuclear, nuclear war, nuclear war. Oh my God. Dear Luna, I sometimes don't like Israel, but I love Israel and I love you, sweet, sweet Luna. Come here, let me give you a hug. The next one is called A Salesman Turned Fundraiser Talks to His Dog. I shouldn't have chosen a career as a salesman and now it's non-profit equivalent fundraiser. I was seduced by the quote, infinite income potential, which turns out to be at best an overstatement. Too often, if you do too well, they set a cap on your income. They lower your in commission rate, change your territory, there's something worse, some shit like that. Worse. Worse, selling, including nonprofit fundraising, is very stressful. Make your number or you get a worse prospect list, or even worse, you're out. So when day is done, I need to process it all. And my favorite listener is my dog, Gretchen. Here's a paraphrase of what I said to her today. Admittedly, it was a particularly bad day at work. Gretchen... I thought I'd be happier pitching the museum than dodge cars, but it's as, well, dodgy. I can't help but worry about asking people to donate to an art museum. Yeah, they're rich, and yeah, some of them got their money by stretching the truth, but so do I. And most of those people work hard for their money. Can I really look them in the eye and say that donating to an art museum or to a university that has plenty of money and too often woke eyes is its students are the best use of their charity dollars? when deep down I believe that, for example, cancer or Salvation Army or Big Brothers are better causes. I tried to get a job selling for a better cause than an art museum, but the competition for those is crazy. Maybe it's time for me to cut my losses and throw a party for all the people who like me and ask them if they know of someone who, you know, who, um, who could hire me for something different. I have no idea what that would be. In the meantime, I'm going to take you for a walk, dear Gretchen. You can pee and I can de-stress. Anyway, that story is called The Salesman Turned Fundraiser Talks to His Dog. This one is a dancer talks to her dog. 
I do ballet, and we all have to act like dance is everything. No one would dare express doubts, and I'm not going to stick my neck out. So today, I decided to spill my guts to my dog, Arabesque. Here's the essence of what I said. I've put in all this time to learn ballet, and when I'm on stage, it's fun, but it's getting to be less fun. And I'm on stage only a few minutes for every 10 hours I'm rehearsing or practicing on my own. And my feet are starting to get bad. No surprise, that's happening to all of us. So arabesque, I'm just about ready to quit, but to what? Teach dance? I'd still have to live with my parents. Something outside of dance? I have no idea what. I'm not going to be a computer programmer or a carpenter or a salesperson. Arabesque, did I make a mistake putting all this time and effort into ballet? I can't think about it now. Arabesque, you want to go for a walk or watch me practice for my next performance? Anyway, that's a dancer talking to her dog. Next one is called The 2012 State Fair Beauty Queen Talks to Her Dog. I'm feeling insecure, and you'll laugh, but I feel most comfortable talking about it to my dog, Lucy. Here's kind of what I just said to her. From when I was a little girl, they always called me pretty, but never smart. And it's true, I'm not. I just always have been a little slower to pick things up than most people are. I'm not even sure if I have a lot of common sense. I, I mean, behind my back, I hear that people call me an airhead, a space cadet, you know. I've always done okay, mainly just using my looks. Guys, jobs. I won State Fair Beauty Queen back in 2012, but now I'm 30, and I see my looks starting to fade, and I'm getting scared. To be honest, here in California, where the job market is so hard, I can't see myself making good money year after year. They make us feel guilty for wanting a wallet husband. They still use the word gold digger. Makes me feel bad, guilty. But if I'm honest, while I respect all those women doctors, women lawyers, women executives, that's just not me. I think I really would like to be a traditional housewife, keep house, have kids, and yeah, be supported by my husband. But how to find him? No more nightclubs. That's what got me in trouble with my first husband. He'd rather drink than talk. That says it all. But I do bad in classes, so that won't work for me. The gym? Maybe, but they all seem so judgmental, and I'm starting to get a belly and even a little cottage cheese thighs. Setups? Yeah, I probably need to ask my friends again. But this time i got to tell them no more bad boys, no matter how cute. Yes, decent looking, but he's got to be stable and someone I can count on to bring home the bacon. He doesn't have to be rich, just middle class. That's not asking too much, is it? I'm nice, and I think I'd be a good homemaker and mommy. That's a fair deal, right? Oh, sweet Lucy. Oh, I forgot to feed you. I am so sorry. I'll do it right now. I love you, Lucy. Anyway, that story is called The 2012 State Fair Beauty Queen Talks to Her Dog. The next one is called I Could Say This Only to My Dog. I still am the CEO, but had to go on leave because my hip is so bad. Ironically, our nonprofit aims to increase the poor's access to health care, but it's biting me in the back, or should I say the hip. I've searched doctor after a doctor, and the best I can get is a four-month wait, and to be honest, I'm not sure how good a hip surgeon he is. Even though I'm the CEO, I can't say a word. I'd likely get the three C's, censure, censor, and cancel. The only person I can speak honestly to is my dog. Here's a paraphrase of what I said to her today. Even though I've paid so much into the system, when those we lobby for haven't, their activists, liberal politicians, medical schools, nonprofits like ours are clamoring for redistributing yet more to them. And here I sit in such pain that I've had to take a leave of absence. I'm 55 and know that these are likely my last highly productive years. I want to be as contributory as I can, and the system increasingly won't let me. Activists' pitches for yet more health care redistribution are just the tip of the iceberg. I already pay more than half my income in taxes. The top 1% of earners pay 42.3% of the federal income tax. Atop that, I pay, by the way, all these statistics I'm going to provide and these assertions. If you go to medium.com on my channel and or look at these, uh, these stories, you'll see I have links to authoritative sources for all of them. Anyway, top 1% of earners pay 42.3% of the federal income tax. Atop that, I pay much more when we include sales tax, property tax, car registrations, tolls, etc. 
I don't keep a dime till August, maybe September. If the president of the United Auto Workers Union recently spawned a movement, eat the rich. Most rich people work long and hard, delaying gratification, yeah, for money, but also for contribution. Is that a fair way to treat such contributory citizens? And I do have deep concern about illegal immigration. Disproportionately, people who haven't done well in their home country or they wouldn't have wanted to endure all of coming here. And it doesn't bode well for their future, future law abidingness, that they chose to break our laws by coming here illegally and then take money from taxpayers, not just in health care, but in, for example, education, welfare, and of course, the cost of crime. Each victim of a mere smash and grab, let alone an assault, let alone rape or murder, is a human being who suffers unnecessarily. Disproportionately, those crimes are committed by the poor. We've already spent $22 trillion on the poor for 50 years trying to close the achievement gap, yet the gap remains as wide as ever. Even the vaunted Head Start has largely failed. Can we be optimistic that an answer lies in DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, as claimed by the likes of dozens of times accused plagiarist and just resigned Harvard president Claudine Gay? DEI's under-the-surface principle is to redistribute yet more from society's contributors to those less so, heavily based on race. Does that provide a realistic basis for optimism for America's ascendancy or for its decline? Yet the Democrats, with the media's amplifying support, are doing what they can, while not damaging their re-election chances, to allow the illegality. The number of illegals entered since Biden took office is the most in history. There are now 50 million foreign-born U.S. residents, also the highest in history. The Democrats know that the illegals, who will then become citizens as part of, quote, comprehensive immigration reform, will overwhelmingly vote Democrat. What would Biden say to the millions of legal immigrants of all backgrounds who followed the law and entered legally? I guess that every generation, when it gets old, thinks the younger generation is wrong-headed. I'm no exception. Excuse me, but my hip is killing me now. I need to take a pill and a nap. Thank you, dear doggy. You're pretty much the only person to whom I can speak the truth. I love you. The next one, so that one is called a um, uh, CEO. I, didn't see it. I could only say this to my dog from the CEO's perspective. Um, this one is called uh, an 85-year-old talks to his dog. I hate that now I feel compelled to think mainly about my health, or more accurately, my lack of health. I don't want to burden others with it, so I talk to my dog. Here's a paraphrase of what I just said to Daisy. I probably just have a cold, but I'm going to take a COVID test now. With all my comorbidities and old ages path downward to misery and death, maybe I should hope I get COVID and die of it. They say that respiratory diseases like pneumonia are among the easier ways to go, an old man's best friend. Old man's best friend. <laughs> Why, when we men have the ultimate deficit, we die six years younger and live our last decade in worse health no one gives a shit. All we see is another run for breast cancer. Yet if women are underrepresented in some field, there is massive redress. <laughs> but I can't do anything about that. No one can. It's the woke DEI unfairness. It's unstoppable because they've taken control of society's mind molders, the schools, the colleges, the media, even entertainment media. I am scared of ages worsening pain. Yet I'm always reluctant to go to the doctor. They'll do tests that can confirm or even exceed my worst fears, and too often they make mistakes. Oh, I wish I could just suddenly not wake up, but not yet. I still enjoy life's little pleasures, coffee, conversation, and yes, you, sweet Daisy. I sure would want my doctor to help me die if I were in bad pain, but the rules are so damn strict. You have to be compass mentis, mentally competent. Many people in bad pain aren't, and you must have less than six months to live. Why can't I off myself when I want? It's life's most personal decision, and the government shouldn't invade that. They defend a woman's right to an abortion, but not a person's decision as to when life is too painful. Damn them. 
I wonder what they'll say about me at my funeral. No doubt it'll be BS that makes me look like a saint. But the truth, I'm just a middling guy in a world that goes from old Milwaukee to Heineken. I'm a bud. Thank you, dear Daisy. I feel you're the only person I can say this stuff to. Okay, now I'm going to take that COVID test, and I'm not sure what to wish for. Anyway, that uh, those are the stories uh, that I wanted to share with you that are, I'm calling this private thoughts. Uh, as usual, I welcome your thumbs up and accept your thumbs down. I always look forward to your comments and especially like it if you hit the share button below. Share on your social media so that my efforts can have broader impact. And I am flattered if you subscribe to my channel, whether here on YouTube or your, your on the podcast on, on Spotify, Apple, or uh, Amazon podcasts. But in any event, I do thank you for listening or watching. I like to end all these podcasts with my very favorite slogan that I believe is more apt today than ever. It's written not by me, but by a guy named Frank A. Clark. We find comfort among those who agree with us, growth among those who don't. <laughs>